Okay, we're starting up again. Uh, digestion two. All right. And uh, starting off with where we left off, regulation of gastric motility. Uh, three phases. And this is all on page uh, 1053, as a matter of fact. Cephalic phase, did, they all have reflex next to them because this is, of course, all reflex. You have no control over this. Although, uh, uh, yeah, you don't have any control even in all the cephalic phase, higher brakes, higher centers to medulla, in, in, um, increase the parasympathetic nervous system along the vagus nerve. So this could be a vagal vagal or long reflex, just thinking about food. If you're hungry and you're thinking about food, in particular, you smell food, congratulations, you, you've, you're starting digestion. You've fired up the digestive system already. The stomach will start to uh, secrete stuff and start moving even before the food reach, uh, hits it. So that's a cephalic phase. Gastric uh, phase is when begins when food actually does hit the stomach and stretches it out. So there are stretch receptors and chemoreceptors that can detect, uh, you know, the uh, the presence of food. And this causes the secretion of gastrin. Gastrin feeds back upon um, the um, uh, muscles and glands of the stomach and turns uh, the secretion on and turns on the motility. And then as you really start to uh, squeeze the stomach and push things around, remember, some of the food, the kind gets pushed into the pyloric region uh, and that stretching opens up the pyloric valve and some of the chyme empties into the small intestine. When that happens, then we have the intestinal phase of uh, gastric motility. And this one's gonna slow things down. The cephalic phase and gastric phase speed things up, fire up the stomach. The intestinal phase is gonna slow it down because once you have chyme moving into the small intestine, you want to have time to deal with it before you push more stuff in there. So, so several um, hormones are going to be secreted by the uh, uh, duodenum, the very first part of the small intestine. A couple of them are CCK or cholestokinin, and one of them is called secretin. There's also one called uh, glucose insul insulinotropic peptide, GIP, and these are going to feed back upon the stomach and turn it down, slow things down. And, and so, because now you got to work on it, you got to break down the stuff, the chyme that's in the intestine, and absorb it before we push more stuff down. And then that secretion of those uh, hormones will fall down, uh, gas will be secreted, and you fire the stomach again, because those things are going to inhibit the secretion of gas. Okay. Vomiting. That's a defensive mechanism. That's actually, uh, think of that as part of the immune system. Em emesis is a fancy name for vomiting. And there's an emetic center in the medulla oblongata that if you get the, the right irritation in the stomach, you can reverse peristalsis and you can send stuff up. Okay, digestion absorption, not much in stomach. It's gastric lipase, so we're gonna have some uh, digestion of, uh, of lipids in the stomach. No digestion of carbohydrates because the salivary amylase has been denatured by the acid. So there's gonna be some digestion of protein from pepsin. Um, and a little bit's going to be absorbed, but not that much. One thing, interesting thing is alcohol is absorbed by the stomach. And uh, that's why it's sometimes not a good idea to drink alcohol in an empty stomach because it gets absorbed very uh, soon into the bloodstream to the stomach. Okay. Protection. Mucus coat protects the, the lining of the uh, uh, stomach from the acid that's made by these gastric glands. Uh, and you have tight junctions between the, uh, the cells so the, hot, so the secretions get, get in between those. Um, and you constantly replace 
the epithelium. I said throughout the entire GI tract, you're constantly replacing those cells. Pacemaker cells is a basic rhythm of the stomach function set up by the enteric nervous system. Right? So we already talked about the uh, cephalic phase, higher brain centers, um, uh, particularly uh, hypothalamus, hunger center, stimulating medulla oblongata, and parasympathetic input to the, uh, to the digestive system. G gastric phase stimulated by acetylcholine. That is the post-ganglionic neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. So you'd think that acetylcholine would turn things on. Histamine turns it on and gastric turns it on, um, the gastric phase. The intestinal phase, that's called the enterogastric reflex. The secretion of secretin, cholestochinin, and glucose insulinotropic peptide uh, all feed back up on the stomach and slow things down, right? inhibit the stomach, inhibit gastric mobility and secretion. These hormones do other things too. Secretin really stimulates the pancreas to release pancreatic juice, right? Uh, and put it into the small intestine. Uh, cholestochinin uh, has a big effect on the gallbladder, causes the gallbladder to constrict and push by it into the duodenum. And glucose insulinotropic peptide stimulates the pancreas also, but stimulates the endocrine part of the pancreas to secrete insulin. Because you're gonna need insulin now, because I assume you're, eat, uh, you know, you're eating carbohydrates, and you're gonna to have to get those into, into cells, so you need insulin for that. Um, it used to be called gastric inhibitory peptide, because it also inhibits the stomach, uh, but now it's called glucose insulinotropic peptide, but they can keep the same acronym, GIP, fits both. Okay. So now we shift into the small intestine, right? Um, three parts, duodenum or duodenum, some people pronounce it that way, jejunum, middle part, ileum, last part. Um, the duodenum is the shortest part, and it's where um, all the, uh, the secretions from the pan uh, pancreas and liver go into there. And then the jejunum takes over. And that's the middle part, and that's where most digestion and absorption occurs in the jejunum. And then finally in the ileum, the last part that connects up to the large intestine. And the ileum is where B12 and in intrinsic factor are absorbed. That's the important part about the ileum. Now the differences between these, you can't, you have to be an expert to tell the difference between these. Uh, it's, it's like the microscopic differences, but a gastroenterologist, I guess if you looked at a slide, could tell you the difference between duodenum and jejunum or jejunum and ileum. But as you see in the lab, I can't, you can't point out, oh, this is jejunum. We do know, first part of the wadam because it attaches to the stomach. But when the wadam ends and the jejunum takes over, we can't tell. Same thing with the ileum. We know the last part that attaches to the large intestine is ileum. Where does that ileum become jejunum? Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Valves or sphincters. Or sphincters, valves. Pyloric. That's between the stomach and small intestine. Then the ileocecal is between the small intestine and the large intestine. And the gastroilia reflex is, a, is the uh, 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 reflex that um, if you stretch the ileum, this will tend to open the ileocecal valve. And also, gastrin secreted by an active stomach is also going to uh, make it to the ileocecal valve and, and help, help to open it. And this makes sense because by the time the chyme has reached the ileum, it's pretty much got all the absorption done, except for water. All the nutrients have been absorbed. And we pretty, pretty much just have um, indigestible matter now, actually fecal matter. Uh, and so 
if uh, so we want to move that along into the large intestine uh, because we got if we got more stuff coming in here we got to move the old stuff along if we got more stuff coming in here so gastrin will help open the ileal sequel valve the histology it has villi these finger-like projections along the small intestine and even those villi have microvilli so it's a huge surface area in the small intestine because that's where, like I said, most of the absorption takes place. And now microvilli is called a brush border. There are also lacteals. In its villus, it's a lacteal, a uh, lymphatic capillary. And those are going to be important for uh, absorbing and transporting dietary fat. Okay. Okay, so villi have absorptive and goblet cells. Goblet cells are uh, mucus producing cells. Um, absorptive cells are brush border enzymes and transport proteins. So there are brush border enzymes. There are enzymes that line, uh, that are in the, uh, that are membrane proteins in the uh, intestinal cell, in the intestinal cells. And they're gonna actually help to, um, to uh, turn on proteases made by the pancreas. The pancreas is going to make uh, all kinds of enzymes. It's going to make uh, uh, amylases, lipases, proteases, um, and the proteases are made in an active form, of just like the one in the stomach. And the reason, reason for this is you don't want to digest yourself. These are dangerous proteins. Um, if they were just made in an active form, you might actually digest the cell that, that made them. So you have to put them in an inactive form, put them in a lumen, and then activate them. Okay. Transport proteins, we're going to get into that mostly when we get into how uh, certain ions are transported in the blood, like iron, uh, and also how fat is transported in, in, uh, in the blood by these special transport proteins. Okay, intestinal crypts between villi, uh, goblet cells and duodenal glands, mucus, and then our unicellular gland cells that make a protein called enteropeptidase. This is a uh, this is an inactive uh, protein uh, chewing enzyme, uh, as I mentioned. Um, secretion. One or two videos of intestinal juice. So it makes a lot of uh, uh, juice, uh, mucusy juice, one or two liters. There's a lining right there of the small intestine. You have this, uh, these plea circularis, the circular folds that have, uh, that have all these villi on them. And the villi have microvilli, as I mentioned, huge surface area. Um, and there's a, a uh, Cross section, we'll see this in the lab too, a cross section of the villus with the capillaries in the villi, the blood capillaries, and then the lacteal, the lymph capillary. Okay, and uh, there in the, uh, the submucosa. All right. Oh, the lymphatic nodules. We're going to see these lymphatic nodules. They're filled with macrophages and dendritic cells. And these are um, actually part of, it, this is malt tissue, mucosa associated lymphatic tissue that is found uh, running all mucous membranes that have access to the outside. And it's the first line of defense, remember. It's part of uh, non-specific um, defense, the second tier of, of, uh, of, of defense, uh, innate, uh, defense, um, and they're also known as peers patches, and you'll see these in the lab as well. Okay, then you have these simple columnar epithelial cells, goblet cells, which are mucus, intestinal gland cells, synthesizes enteropeptidases, uh, inactive protein enzymes, and then uh, enteroendocrine cells secretes the hormone, secretin, uh, 
was the kinin and glucose insulinotropic peptide. Okay. So regulation of secretion again, acetylcholine turns on this secretion. It's the parasympathetic, the postganglionic parasympathetic uh, neurotransmitter. Um, and as I mentioned, just mentioned, enteroendocrine cells secrete CCK, secretin and GIP. Small intestine pairs patches, those are the patches of mold tissue. And then segmentation is how chyme is moved through the small intestine. It's, um, as I mentioned, it's just like peristalsis, contraction of the circular longitudinal muscles, but it's not called peristalsis. It's called segmentation when we get into the small intestine. Okay, the liver. Let's look at some accessory um, digestive organs. The liver, remember it has sinusoids. These are the leakiest um, capillaries in your body. And they're full of what's called reticular endothelial cells. Um, remember it's a portal system. You have these capillaries, both capillaries in the villi and the small intestine, uh, and they coalesce into a hepatic portal vein, brings uh, blood to the liver and empties that uh, blood into the sinusoids and then the hepatocytes decide what to do with all these nutrients. And there's, and there's sort of like lobules, like uh, six-sided lobules in uh, liver and at the corners of these um, lobules are what are called triads, where we have a branch of the hepatic artery with a branch of the hepatic portal vein and we have a uh, bile ductule that make up a triad. Three things, hence the triad. The bile, of course, is, co is collected by um, the hepatocytes. Uh, remember, that's one of the major functions of liver is to break down old red blood cells. So, um, so the breakdown products of, um, of the heme groups, the hemoglobin, are made into bile salts and they are sent into the gallbladder. That's what the bile salts are. And it's lecithin, which is a uh, emulsifier you find in bile. Um, and there's something called the enterohepatic circulation. This is bile is a really, uh, is, uh, has a lot of cholesterol in it um, uh, that helps, uh, along the lecithin, that helps emulsify fat. And it, help, it helps in the small intestine. And then later on in the larger, in the uh, later on in the small intestine, it is reabsorbed back into the blood, put into these things called LDLs, and then sent back to the liver and reused. That's called the enterohepatic circulation. Uh, and there is the, um, the uh, bile ducts. Uh, the right, what are the left and right hepatic ducts become the, uh, the common hepatic duct, the cystic duct leads into the gallbladder, and then the common um, uh, hepatic and cystic duct merge to form the common bile duct. The common bile duct merges with the main pancreatic duct. Um, uh, at the what's called a hepato, hepatopancreatic ampulla, and then it empties into the small, the, the duodenum at what's called the main duodenal papilla. These are gonna be things you're gonna to need to know in the lab. We pull those out in the lab, and those could be on the next, uh, on the digestive system lab course. Now here's a cross section through liver, through these lobules of the liver, and you can see that uh, the triad at the outside, the branch of hepatic portal vein, branch of hepatic artery, and a bile ductile. The blood's going toward the central vein, the bile is going toward the triad, so toward the outside. And uh, then the, the uh, central vein, will, uh, all the central veins are coalesce into the hepatic vein, the hepatic vein will bring blood to the uh, uh, if you're in a cava and back to the heart. So remember, uh, I think we asked that question in uh, 
the vessels of labcoids, hepatic portal vein brings blood to the liver, the hepatic, uh, the hepatic vein brings blood away from the liver. Okay. Pancreas. Remember the pancreas is both a exocrine and endocrine organ, a gland. It has ducts, and that's what makes pancreatic juice. Uh, and, then, and then in the endocrine part are the islets of Langerhans, which make uh, insulin and glucagon. Let's look at the exocrine portion, pancreatic juice. What's make, what makes up pancreatic juice? Of course, water. Enzymes. Uh, these are called zymogens. The zymogens is another name for these inactive enzymes. Right? It's got a lot of sodium bicarbonate in it. It's actually a, quite a basic uh, solution. Right? These zymogens are called trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase. These are all uh, inactive uh, pro, uh, proteases, enzymes that break down uh, protein. And they, uh, there's going to be much border enzymes in the one that they're that they, that are going to uh, chew off a little piece of these things, the ogen part, and they'll become trypsin, chymotrypsin, and, and procarboxy uh, pepsin. Uh, that will become the active enzymes that will chew up proteins. But also, the pancreas makes uh, enterokinase, which helps also to, to, to make these proteases, uh, proteases uh, active. But it makes a pancreatic amylase and a pancreatic lipase. So the pancreas, we've seen other organs making an enzyme here or there, like, salivary, like the salivary glands makes an amylase and a lipase. The uh, stomach makes, makes a lipase and a protease, but the pancreas makes all three of them, proteases, lipases, and amylases. And there's a picture of the, uh, of the pancreas um, with the main pancreatic duct, and there's the accessory pancreatic duct. Um, and the uh, accessory uh, pancreatic duct empties into the minor duodenal papilla. The, the main pancreatic duct combines with the common bile duct to form the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which empties into the duodenum at the major duodenal uh, papilla. Get a large intestine, the large intestine now, parts, uh, the cecum. That is an inferior part, just uh, inferior to where the ileal uh, cecal valve is a blind-ended pouch called a cecum. And at the end of the cecum is the vermiform appendix. Then going superiorly, this is on the right side, superiorly is the ascending colon, and then it makes, makes a right-hand turn to the left, uh, and what's called the hepatic flexion, because the liver is right there. In the transverse colon, uh, another word for the large intestine is the colon, and then it makes another right hand turn down on the left side, and that's called the splenic flexure because the spleen is on that side. Then you have the descending colon, then uh, there's an S shaped uh, inferiorly in a pelvic cavity that it, it, it forms an S curve called the sigmoid colon. This sigmoid colon becomes the rectum, and the rectum empties uh, into the anus. There are internal and external sphincters, uh, fortunately, at the anus um, that um, the, ex uh, the internal is uh, reflexively opened by stretching of the rectum. Fortunately, the external sphincter is under ball barrier control, uh, and so we can avoid that material uh, at the proper uh, place and time. There's intestinal crypt, crypts, which have secretion of, uh, of, of mucus, remember it's a mucus membrane. Bacteria flora and flatus, flatus. 
bacteria flora are, are all the, uh, the trillions of bacteria uh, that, uh, in your uh, uh, large intestine, in your, in your colon. Uh, they used to be called flora because they were put in with plants, but now they, they, they are bacteria. And they unfortunately make gas because they, uh, they actually digest some of the stuff um, that we can't. And uh, some of the fiber that we eat, they digest it and they make gas out of it. And that's what flatus is. And so that's intestinal gas. Absorption and motility. The big thing about function of the large intestine is really to absorb mostly water. It absorbs some ions and stuff, but mostly water. Because by the time the chyme gets there, it's, you know, there's no more nutrients left in it. But we have to remove water from it and make it so that it's uh, uh, solid, but not too solid, right? Um, and so remember, we ha has to have some water. And remember, one of the ways you lose water is about 200 milliliters a day in your feces. You want to make sure that feces is watery enough that it passes uh, easily enough and doesn't get compacted. Now, the the um, way things are moved along the large intestine are called haustal contractions and mass movements. Because there are pouches of, uh, of smooth muscle along the large intestine um, that uh, contract and they're called haustra. And so they contract and push things along. Um, and these are also called mass movements. They're moving along the, uh, the uh, uh, what essentially is fecal material now in the large intestine. Um, and the, 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 uh, the house jar of generally uh, circular muscle, the, the longitudinal muscle is, uh, is condensed into this strip called tina coli that runs the whole length of the large intestine. Well, there's the large intestine right there. You'll see the cecum Iliocecal valve, the gluteal appendix, uh, the ascending uh, colon, the right colic flexure, um, also known as the paddock flexure, the transverse colon, the left colic flexure, or also the splenic flexure, descending colon, uh, sigmoid, uh, and finally the rectum, and then anal canal. Um, and all along those, that Tyena coli is, is a strip of longitudinal muscle, and there are little bits of uh, fat that are hanging off of the large intestine called the omental appendix, appendages, some, uh, also known as the epiploic appendages. Um, and you can see the anal uh, a canal now, and the anal canal is lined by uh, stratified squamous epithelium, and you can see the internal and external anal you know, sphincters there. And we're going to be talking about defecation in a moment. So movement stimulated by gastrocolic and duodenocolic reflexes. So stretching of the duodenum, stretching of the stomach actually causes things to move uh, uh, along the, uh, uh, because that stimulates the enteric nervous system and that sends signals along the enteric nervous system to the large intestine stimulating that muscle to contract. And it makes sense, right? Like I said, you put stuff, new stuff in here, you wanna get rid of the old stuff. All right. And in the large intestine, uh, you absorb some water, uh, some electrolytes, ions, and some short chain fatty acids. Actually, the bacteria, as I mentioned, in your colon, actually break down some of the, of the fiber that you eat and make them into these short chain fatty acids. And we can absorb those. And they generally just stay where they are in the cells lining the, the large intestine. And, and these cells use those for nutrition. So defecation, intrinsic defecation reflex. It's a parasympathetic reflex that when the rectum is uh, expanded, uh, that will, that will uh, uh, stimulate the stretch receptors and they'll send information into the sacral region of the spinal cord and that'll send out the, uh, uh, 
information along these parasympathetic nerves that lead back to the uh, uh, to the anus and will open the intrinsic uh, the uh, the internal sphincter, and that's when you get that that feeling. Oh, oh, it's time to go. Uh, I have to go to the uh, bathroom soon. And then there's a voluntary portion of the external sphincter where you can open that up voluntarily and use the valsalva maneuver to help push feces out. So there is the defecation reflex, uh, rectum contents stimulate baroreceptors in rectal wall. Sensory input initiated by baroreceptors to rectum is related to the spinal cord within the sacral region. Uh, Parasympathetic motor neurons head back to the uh, to the uh, uh, to, to the anus um, and increases motor output to smooth muscle of rectum. Rectum contracts, squeezing the contents, decrease motor output to internal anal you know, sphincter, causes sphinc sphincter relaxation. And uh, what it doesn't show is a collateral from that um, parasympathetic nerve in the spinal cord that goes up to your cerebral cortex eventually, and you become aware that I have to defecate. Okay. And then the somatic motor, a nerve signal from cerebral cortex comes down to the somatic motor ac uh, axon that leads to the external sphincter. And it can release the external sphincter to allow defecation. Now there are some disorders, uh, uh, diverticulosis um, is, um, is uh, outpocketing of uh, little parts of the house throughout the large intestine and feces can get trapped in there and become inflamed. Um, and uh, one of the things that helps prevent that is fiber. Now we'll talk about that fiber much more in the next chapter, how uh, insoluble carbohydrate is actually um, uh, very healthy. You don't get the tribe any nutritional benefit, but it helps move things along and help prevent things like diverticulosis. Um, cancer, that's why uh, uh, colonoscopies are a good idea. I think I'm due for one. I had one like five years ago and it was, it was clean, so everything was good, but one of the major cancers that kill people is colon cancer. And, um, and so you need to be scoped to look for polyps and things, uh, particularly when you get older, like I am. Uh, constipation and diarrhea, thing about, good thing about fiber is cellulose, plant material, helps to fill things up, helps to stretch the, the GI tract and push things along. It makes you regular. So what good thing about it? It's good to defecate every day, uh, and, and fiber is going to help you do that. Um, cholera. This is drinking dirty water. It's a it's it's a it's a bacterium that prevents the uh, the absorption of water from your uh, uh, large intestine and causes massive diarrhea. And uh, you know, in this country, it could be discomforting and, uh, and uh, embarrassing perhaps, but we could, take, uh, we could take care of it with antibiotics. But in other countries, in third world countries, actually, I don't know how many children die every year in third world countries from massive diarrhea because they, it just completely dehydrates them. And they, the parents can't get them hydrated enough. And of course, they're giving the same filthy water they gave them the collar in the first place. So, and then I don't know why I put the John Wayne myth in here. John Wayne died of cancer, but there was some kind of mythology about him dying from compacted feces. They had all these compacted feces in his uh, GI tract. And it's completely false. Uh, uh, even a small amount of compacted feces would be incredibly uh, painful. And I don't know where that, that myth uh, got started. But anyway, that's <laughs> not particularly important. OK. Um, well, let's uh, stop right there and we'll get on to chemical digestion and absorption. Talk a little more about that.
in, an, in the next video. So I'm gonna stop this, uh, stop this one right here and uh, uh, see you later in the next uh, video.